Hi, everyone. My name is Albert Świdziński. Welcome to another Strategy and Future podcast. And this is the sixth installment of our special, special series that covers everything that happened throughout the Zapad exercise. With me is, of course, Nick Myers, as with the previous, previous episodes. Thank you, Nick, for being with us today. Thanks, Albert. And interestingly enough, uh, yesterday when we spoke, Nick pointed out there, that there wasn't much going on, that it was a slow day. And I don't think, I don't, don't think things, have, things have changed so much since yesterday. So Nick, what, what happened? Yeah, that's correct. In fact, uh, we get to end the series an episode earlier than we were originally expecting. Uh, today, uh, according to the Moscow press releases, about noon or so, by, by the time of the press release, it probably heard, happened earlier that morning, uh, Deputy Defense Minister Yunus Bekyevkorov, the head of training of the Russian MOD, uh, showed up in Molino and declared that uh, they were done. So a bit of a whimpery end to the exercise. Uh, but there's still a couple of additional details that were released over the course of the previous 24 hours. I'll bring up the map one last time here. Um, uh, interesting, there, there was a dispute in the uh, timing as to when precisely this occurred, but the 76 Guards Air Assault Division based in Pskov did do uh, the last two descent operations that they had uh, said they were going to do earlier. Uh, one, of course, occurred in Pravginsky, uh, reported quite early this morning uh, by the Russians, and the other one occurred in Besh. Um, the Belarusians even reported this one late last night, and the Russians did not report till 7 a.m. this morning. They also had slightly different numbers. I think the Belarusians said there were 350 participants, and the Russians said there were 400 plus participants. So believe whichever side you want to on there. Um, but they did the uh, final descent operation going into the both sides, so showing some degree of force projection capability, but still confined to what the Russians called battalion scale. Uh, 400 dropped seems more like a big company to me, but still they have plenty of supporting forces that I'm sure that were not included in here that did the uh, logistics in the rear. Uh, at least according to the British variant of the exercise, well, actually, according to both of them, the Russians landed, uh, captured their landing zone, defended it from a counterattack, and then ultimately met up with uh, the other forces in the area. So contrary to what I thought earlier, what I had said in this uh, recordings, I think three days ago now, um, this, did not, this did not constitute a strategic landing at all. This was uh, very much the tactical style landing uh, that they were capable of doing a number of years ago. So ended up being a, a pretty underwhelming exercise, in my opinion. I wasn't expecting it to be like an earth shattering moment, but I was kind of expecting this to be a moment where they were going to be exploring other aspects of how the Russians imagine using the military to interfere in what they perceive as the Western hybrid warfare scenario uh, strategy against them. But anyway, there were a couple of other small details worth mentioning. Uh, Russian military police deployed also in Resh stopped a uh, saboteur group from breaking into the uh, store, breaking into the installation where they were storing all of the, uh, where the command HQ was in the in front. Uh, it's interesting because, mostly because the Russian military police were deployed abroad. Uh, not entirely a surprise, but still I'm not aware of them doing that in the past. So something, something important to note. Uh, I mean, obviously, other than at the Russian bases deployed well, like in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, obviously it's an exception, but still, first time I, I can recall of Russian military police being deployed abroad. Um, and then the, the Belarusians were also reporting that there was a fairly large Russian logistics hub. Uh, the Belarusians suggest it was an entire brigade, uh, most likely the 69th logistics brigade from the West First Guards Tank Army. Uh, I strongly doubt the entire brigade had deployed, but uh, the Belarusians claimed that there was a large Russian logistics formation at Obazlovsky, also reported today. And um, we also saw more uh, heavy artillery usage at Obazlovsky against enemy command posts. So a final disruption of enemy C2 to finish off the, uh, conventional, the conventional dimension to this. 
Uh, to answer a couple of other points that I had raised earlier, we only saw Shoigu and Gerasimov show up once to this exercise definitively. And that was when Putin came to visit uh, Molino out of Nizhny Novgorod Oblast out here on Monday. And even then, the Russian MOD did not cover even Putin's visit. Uh, it only showed up in the Kremlin's press coverage of this. So uh, kind of bizarre that there wasn't uh, more overt coverage of this, especially since Gerasimov visited Molino on a number of occasions over the preceding months as they were getting ready for Zappa 2021. Um, and in, in addition, today when Yevkurov came out there, uh, it's Yevkurov's been sort of the point man for organizing this exercise over the past couple of months. He visited Belarus on many occasions in order to scout out the particular polygons they wanted to use, as well as verifying that everything was all set, uh, including for the Russian echelons arriving ahead of the exercise. So it's not terribly surprising that he'd be the person to announce that this was over. But he showed up in Molino and said, on behalf of Sergei Shoigu, I'm here to tell you all did a great job and you can all go home now. Uh, which you kind of think that Shoigu would be willing to do that himself. Now, obviously, as I tweeted out this morning, and I might have been able to read before we did our last video, but ended up just not being in the particular coverage of news feeds that I was going through. Uh, Putin is in self-isolation right now for coronavirus. Um, so that may have played into the decision to end things earlier. I'm not entirely sure it was not overtly tied to his visit to Zabad here. It was specifically tied to a member of his entourage uh, testing positive, which might mean just about anything, especially as we're going in, especially as Putin had a pretty active schedule this past weekend, uh, opening a new Alexander Nevsky Memorial, uh, doing the Moscow City Day celebration, as well as all sorts of activities preceding the Duma elections coming up relatively soon. So all in all, it's just sort of um, just sort of a glad day for the end of Zappa 2021, but eh, with, it, with things over, we could all relax just a bit more, um, perhaps a bit more confident in the fact that they just weren't feeling sufficiently confident to test anything more advanced in terms of these last descent operations and they ended up doing. So um, I'm open to any questions you've got here. I've got plenty more observations, but those, that was really some total of all of the events that we saw today happening within Zappa 2021. Fair enough, Nick. So I, I, I guess the time for that question will come after a while once we sort of digest or you digest all the, all the data concerning the exercise and everything that surrounds it. But what is your gut feeling? Why this, why this um, subdued, sort of signaling in, in the same way that she spoke about low coverage of Putin's visit to Molina and, you know, the overall shape and, and form the Zappa 21 took. How come? Where the Russians, they definitely were trying to signal something, but what exactly and why? So one of the most curious dichotomies that has occurred throughout this entire exercise is that the Russians have been emphasizing there's 200,000 people involved, but of course only 13,000 minus in the actual areas that are considered one exercise for the purposes of the Vienna document. So it was already sort of a comical bifurcation of messaging as to whether or not uh, this was a huge exercise or just not a very important one. Um, the second, uh, the second dimension to this that I just find quite curious is that it ended up looking almost exactly like Zappa 2013, um, with the, the like the one deviation being that the VDB did three, or sorry, four designs over the course of it, as opposed to just the one extremely tiny one uh, that was the culminating point of the exercise eight years ago now. Um, and Zappa 2013, in many ways, was sort of the end of a previous era. Uh, Union Shield 2015 was sort of a mediation point moving into the new phase. But this was very much a back to the future type of uh, moment for the Russian for the Russian armed forces in a way that surprised me that I thought that the VDV might try something actually quite substantial. And um, I mean, doing multiple design operations in one week is a big deal, but it's but it pales in comparison even to the scale that they did in uh, Center 2019, for example. I think they tried landing an entire uh, regiment at once, and it was quite a large scale operation indeed. So 
For this particular one, um, honestly, it's it more strikes me that the Russians were trying to deliberately contain their signaling uh, for at least the outside world. For the inside world, they're going to continue to play up the fact of uh, just how large the exercise nominally is. But there are several broader contexts that I can I can draw us into. I know I have heard um, some talk from Western military officials who've been there. The Western military officers have been watching this exercise a bit much more on the ground. And I don't think it's any secret to say that they've been the Russians and the Belarusians have been obsequiously communicating that this is not a prelude to war uh, by despite it being quite close to the borders relative to Zap in 2017, they've been very professional about ensuring that nothing even comes close uh, to the literal border or that there's any sign that uh, a mass mobilization of forces preparing to enter into an invasion, into an invasion um, disposition, I suppose. Build, build up in the build up in the correct way for moving across the border in a way that we saw in the uh, 2014 exercises uh, on the Ukrainian border. So in that way, there has been some particular restraint. I'm happy to go into what I think might be politically containing this, but I'm, that would be my op observations on the purely military ground anyhow. Yeah, this was very interesting, especially that you mentioned uh, the polygons that were or the training grounds that were involved. You know, with, with Brecht and Grodman and stuff like that, and then this being, uh, you know, them deciding to to like drop the quiet pressure across the board. Very interesting. So, Nick, and how, how did the exercise compare? You know, the the phases. However, you want to divide the phases of Zapad. How did they compare to your expectations? What what were you expecting when it comes to uh, the course of Zapad and the outcome? So, firstly. As with like virtually every other Russian military observer I knew going into this, we were all expecting this to be a two-phase exercise because they're all two-phase exercises, except except famously Vostok 2018, which was maneuvers and not an exercise. We were sort of anticipating one step that's going to be the preparing the defenses, establishing communications, air defenses, uh, and then if because of the Zabat precedent, also probably overwhelmingly concentrated on anti-terrorist operations. And then a the second phase that was going to be a lot more of uh, meeting an enemy conventional offensive and turning it back. Uh, we did not get two phases this time. We had a beginning, a, a sort of prologue, where it, which was honestly more interesting than the second half. And then we had the main phase where they tested a whole bunch of new technology and that was pretty much the end once they finished the uh, new technology and the very large tactical engagements that they did at Obos Lesnowski and at Molino, uh, the former on Sunday and the latter on Monday. And much to my surprise, that was apparently all that they needed to do besides uh, carry out the remaining descent operations as promised. Um, so in that sense, I don't recall any of the recent exercises uh, any recent strategic operational exercise anyway, being specifically a new technology demonstration ground and not much else. All of the strategic and operational components, sort of like training what to do in a particular circumstance that the general staff is practicing how to use operational art with the military science that they've been embedding into the individual soldiers and officers over the course of the training season, was actually finished by Sunday. And uh, what we saw on Monday was almost certainly a completely pre-scripted event uh, designed to show off whether or not, well, show off all the wonderful ways in which the new Russian technology functions. Um, and that's just different. I, I suspect that they were looking to do what was the easiest way to do a big political points turnout uh, with the minimal amount of potential threats to communicate over the border, since obviously doing it in Molino is uh, quite a bit different from doing it in Brest, for example, where you practically see it from the from Polish territory. Uh, so that's that was the key difference between Zapad and the most recent set of exercises. 
I'm still sort of anticipating that Gerasimov or Shoigu are going to do an interview relatively soon, which they'll go over. Oh, actually, we did do a whole bunch of interesting things. And the mobile strike echelon that they unveiled earlier when the 106th Guards, sorry, the 31st Guards Air Assault Brigade uh, did its own actions at Molino was actually quite an interesting innovation, uh, slight, slight further variant on uh, the mobile echelon we saw last year but still rather underwhelming. And Nick, as, as per your experience, how do you see the, the Russian forces rotating out of Belarus, the timeline, how it's going to proceed? How do you think that's going to work? Well, if it's anything like Zappa 2017, it will take about a week for most people to go home. Um, in Zappa 2017, it was slightly complicated by the fact that the Russians were operating in uh, two polygons closer to Minsk that were sort of, one of which was off the main track, and also for Vichy. And so all the troops had to move to Minsk first and then get on the main line to go back. Um, and I, at the time there was people, there were some people with, waiting with bated breath, are they gonna occupy the country? But I, I'm anticipating that we should see all the uh, celebrations, people bringing out the bread and salt to the officers returning home in glory, probably, within a week or so. I would not be surprised if we see uh, perhaps a Russian battalion sticking around for yet another iteration of uh, tactical evolutions to work out with the Belarusian armed forces. Uh, it would be entirely within their character to continue to separate these things out and maybe even show us a bit more of what the progressed scenario would be perhaps say a CBRN defense exercise, that they did some of that in the early phases of the um, of Zappa 2021, which is also a bit unusual. But uh, one thing that we do know that should happen anyway, is that the two new combat training centers for which the Russians have deployed forces into Belarus, and there's supposed to be a third one opening up as well, so that one might be in Russian territory instead of in Belarusian territory. All of them are going to stay behind. Uh, one of them is in Grodno, which I think is air defense. So I'd have to check my notes. Let me pull that up now. But um, the another one is uh, a new Russian uh, training center for Air Force for the Air Force with the Su 30s in Bernavici. Uh, they're also going to be staying behind over the long term. Um, yeah, I didn't write down specifically what it was, but the First one showed up on the 28th of August, and the second one showed up uh, shortly, showed up on the 8th of September, right before the Zappa 2021 exercise. And obviously, Grodno and Berenovici are west of Minsk, so uh, very strikingly provocatively placed. These are not officially combat units. Uh, some of you will remember that the Russians did have a very tentative hold on the Belarusian airbase at Bobroisk prior to 2014. And there was longstanding talk of how they were going to uh, transform that into a long-term air base. And then the Belarus and Lukashenko actually stood up against this following the Crimean occupation, but even wanted to stand up about this a bit stronger before the Crimean occupation, uh, followed by uh, a, a general slackening of the Russian demand as the Polish acquisition of the Jasm cruise missile rendered the use of Belarusian air base is a bit less relevant. So it does somewhat surprise me that it has switched so dramatically. Uh, I'm not surprised that Lukashenko has lost all of his chips to play with against the Russians, but I am surprised the Russians would uh, plot for the base that's like right up next to uh, Poland, uh, clearly downrange from the other side. I'm, I'm some of the longer range Polish MLRS, especially after High Mars is delivered can probably target this base without leaving Pol from the comfort of uh, Polish territory. So it is a bit of a surprise that they would plump so far forward, but we can uh, yeah. we can expect them to stay. But do you do you think the Belarusians had anything any say in 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 deciding where those those trainings because that basically renders them you know moot right the the the, the whole point of her defense is you know them being so close means they sort of become useless they, or they become a signaling tool in little else. Do you know who decided? 
in what process where those bases will be stationed we're, we're moving away we're, we're straying away from Zapad, but that's that's interesting so i i did not see much of any process being officially claimed by either side uh, between the signing of the agreement in March and the Russian troops just showing up over the course of the past month, or uh, past half month, actually. So I really don't know precisely uh, where this falls. What I will say with air defense deployed so far forward is that it's less going to be an actual interception of anything that's going on, of any blue forces that will be coming against Russia in the future. Uh, so much as it would be an intelligence gathering position. Um, and th this has, this is pretty traditional for how Russians, how the Russians do defense in depth with something like this, that you'd have the real air defenses much more heavily concentrated around Moscow itself, not terribly surprising, but then you would need, if you have something forward that even if all you can see is that it's being jammed, uh, that at least gets the next levels of the uh, layers to be at a higher degree of readiness. So I, I don't think it's entirely irrelevant, but it is not really combat effective. As for the air base, um, we do know that the Belarusians are procuring and indeed have started to acquire their own C-30 SM. So it's not unreasonable that they're going to learn how to fly the things. And uh, I'm sure the presence of the Russian Air Force in the country is, is going to accelerate that process to a certain extent. I mean, even today, a lot of uh, US allied air forces require rather extensive training programs in the United States in order to keep their pilots certified for a variety of US aircraft. Some of them are somewhat less complicated and older than the Su-30, so we, it's not, it should increase uh, Belarusian combat effectiveness in the medium to long term. Um, but it's, in, in terms of its use as an operational airbase, again, it's pretty questionable. Uh, I am somewhat skeptical that it's actually going to be used at all for a um, forward operating base. The only way that you could potentially do that is if number one, Russia was on the offensive, and number two, they were already suppressing uh, the other side's ability to get uh, planes into the air, which considering uh, current Russian policy, perhaps that might be needed in the medium term, but in the short term, the Russians are pretty content with their position in European diplomacy right at this moment which I think also contributes to why Zappa 2021 was a bit more whimperish than we would have expected. All right, Nick, I think this pretty much wraps up, you know, our today's podcast, and it's, it would appear that it also wraps up Zappa 2021, which is a yeah, we're, bit, uh -huh. we're getting to the end. I think the, the one point I would close on here is that one is that point that I was referring to a moment ago. Uh, I actually a very good friend of mine who had been who has been watching the Russian military even longer than I have was speculating for about the last three odd years that he thought the next Zappa was actually going to be canceled because it was no longer necessary. I, at the time, thought this was kind of silly. They'd come up with some reason why they're not going to do this. It's only to not look weak. But I think the answer we're seeing this year is that considering the way in which the the world is currently distributed. The, the politics of the world is currently distributed in which uh, Russian, the Russian policies in Central Asia and the Caucasus are really, uh, on, really on a very jittery footing, whereas Russian policy in the Middle East and Europe is about as strong as it has been in living memory. Oh, sorry, living memory in the Middle East in Europe, recovering from a very low point last year at a variety of crises in the previous years. But still at a point where the uh, mutual distrust going on within NATO over Afghanistan and uh, skepticism as to whether or not Biden is better than Trump or and all sorts of things related to that does mean that the Russians had a political incentive to not be very provocative with Zapad. The one hole in that logic that I still can't explain, perhaps we will learn from Shoigu in the outbreaking, is under those circumstances, why wasn't the pressure of this exercise not directed against NATO, but instead directed against Ukraine? As the Poganovo, the Poganovo polygon that was supposed to be the epicenter back in April never sent out a single message throughout this exercise. 
I may have just have been because of the local epidemiological situation, but I, I suspect that there was a more conscious decision to just keep the possible provocations down this year, including the possibility that Ukraine would successfully agitate the Europeans into taking a more proactive anti-Russia stance. And I suppose that would be my final thought as we close out Zappa 2021. Fair enough. Okay, thank you again, Nick. And I don't know, maybe we'll we'll do this, we'll run this again in four years. We'll see how it goes. Well, Zyazik and I will do an epilogue in a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks as well. Spencer. We have the exit interviews of Shoigu and Garasma under our belts. But until then, I think we're going to take a break. Um, I know the Russian soldiers at the front deserve a break more than I do. So everybody can go home. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you again, Nick. It was it was great to have you with us, and we'll see you again, and all our listeners at Strategy and Future. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Mm-hmm.